let's see. It's. <laughs> oh, is that <laughs> universal signal? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I can see him. I don't know how to do that. Live now. Okay. So we are live on Facebook. So that means we can we can begin. Hey, everybody, if you're just joining, or if you're checking us out uh, on the 1455 Facebook page, welcome to uh, our November author series event uh, with 1455. I'm Sean Murphy. I'm the executive director of 1455. If, if you don't know who we are, we're a community of writers uh, and, and we uh, form and build this community via our virtual free programming. And I encourage anyone that's interested to check us out at 1455litarts.org. Uh, you can check out what we're up to, what's coming down the pike, as well as a ton of uh, material that we've already recorded via our Lit Fests, our monthly author series, the 1455, 1455 interview, et cetera. Uh, and all of these writers we're about to feature have recently done the 1455 interview. So you can check that out uh, to get further up to speed. Um, Let's get down to brass tacks. We're all about community and inclusivity. So for this particular event, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to feature a genre that's not in my wheelhouse, although one I enjoy thoroughly, but this affords me the opportunity to turn it over to experts in the field so I can get out of the way uh, and listen and learn like the rest of you. Uh, let me tee it up and then I'll introduce the writers and we'll just get right into it. Um, this, this event was advertised as a spirited discussion of writing and publishing crime fiction in the year 2020. These four authors are extremely active in the crime fiction community and all have books out this year. The discussion should delve into what writing and publishing crime fiction in 2020 has been like, uh, particularly in a year marked by social upheaval and protest and how politics and social issues have reflected in their writing and in their roles as writers. So I'm very honored and happy to introduce our four authors. Uh, let me start with Jennifer Hillier. Jennifer writes about dark, twisted people who do dark, twisted things. Born and raised in Toronto and a proud Canadian, she spent eight years in the Seattle area, which is where all her books are set. She loves her son, her husband, the Seahawks, and Stephen King, not equally, but close. She's the author of six novels, including Jar of Hearts, which won the Thriller Award and was shortlisted for the Anthony and McCavity Awards. Her most recent psychological thriller, Little Secrets, was published in April of 2020. Jennifer, thank you for being here. Thank you. Lori, or L.A. Chandler, is an award-winning national best-selling author with Kensington Publishing. The Silver Gun, book one in the Art Deco mystery series, debuted in 2017. The Gold Pawn, which, is, which was Best Historical Agatha nominated, Silver Falchion finalist, was released in 2018. And book three, The Pearl Dagger, which was Suspense Magazine's 2019 Book of the Year, Best Agatha nominated, Lefty nominated, GANYC winner, was released in September 2019. Lori takes a fresh look at the innovative and artful side of the 1930s New York City and features Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia. Her Fight to Keep Creativity Alive series focuses on creativity and how it helps us work, play, and live more fully. She lives in New York City with her family. Thank you for being here, Lori, AKA LA Chandler. Next is Vanessa Lilly. She is the Amazon best-selling author of Little Voices, which received star reviews in Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and was a best debut of 2019 from Bolo Books. She's a board member of Sisters in Crime and regular contributor to the Providence Journal. Her next book, For the Best, was released in September, so her most recent book, and she's currently working on her third, which is set in rural Oklahoma. She's originally from Miami, pronounced Miami, Oklahoma, and is a member of the Oklahoma Cherokee Nation. She now lives in Providence, Rhode Island with her husband and sloth-obsessed son. 
<laughs> Smitten with the small estate, she enjoys organizing book events and literary happenings in the city's robust creative community. And finally, and far last, been far from least, Ed, AKA EA Amar, uh, who we have to give a quick shout out to because Ed, like he does all the time as the platonic ideal of the literary citizen, organized this panel, introduced me to these other great writers of which I'm very grateful for, and is going to uh, take the conch for me in a moment and really uh, take charge of moderating, which I'm delighted to see the stage because as you'll see, he is a raconteur and an all around great guy. Let me introduce this awesome writer. Uh, his most recent thriller, The Unrepentant, which I read and loved and recommend, like I will be recommending all these other books, was a nominee for the 2020 Anthony Award for Best Paperback Original, which was published in 2019. And he was, uh, along with Angie Kim, part of our author uh, series back in April of 2019, as well as being in our last two Lit Fests. So you can check him out when you go to 1455 Lit Arts and see him in action. His next thriller, They're Gone, is publishing tomorrow under his pseudonym, E.A. Bars. He has a monthly column on the Washington Independent Review of Books and is a former member of the National Board of the International Thriller Writers. He's also an active member of Crime Writers of Color, the Mystery Writers of America, and Sin C. Uh, he runs the virtual Noir at the Bar series for Washington, D.C., and has hosted and spoken at a variety of crime fiction, uh, writing, and publishing events nationwide. If you're watching on Facebook or joining us here, I also um, encourage you to send a question to me directly at sean at 1455litarts.org or put something in the Facebook comments. We'll try to get to it. And last, before I get out of the way and shut up, I also encourage you to support independent bookstores. We continue to partner with our pals at DC's historic The Potter's House um, in DC. Uh, and they work with bookshop.org. You can click on any of the links at our website to buy any of these books that we'll talk about tonight. And I encourage you to do that. Uh, gang, thank you so much for being here. Ed, I'm gonna uh, metaphorically hand you the mic and uh, I'll jump in as appropriate, but I'm happy to step out of the way and you guys can get it on. Thank you for being here. All right, thank you so much, Sean. I uh, just to make sure people can hear me. I assume so, yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And I encourage everyone to check out 1455. Uh, when Sean started this two or three years ago, um, it just blew up with a series of events and a literary festival that has gone for two years straight and gets some of the best names in writing, regardless of genre. Um, so I really encourage everyone to check it out. And thank you so much for what you do and for having us on tonight. My pleasure. So I wanted to start off. It's been, as you guys know, a very quiet, subdued year. And I wanted to ask, um, you know, when the, when the pandemic was first realized, which seems like it was mid-March for most of us, how did it affect your writing? Ah, Lori. Okay. <laughs> you know, it was um it was hard. We I live in New York City too, so we were preparing to be the epicenter and we were we knew that was gonna happen even in, in March. So I think it was hard um mentally, but also even physically for a lot. I have two teenage boys, so we were figuring out school in the situations being in the epicenter of everything. And then we had we ended up going to Michigan uh to, to take care of my folks and um to get out of the city for a while. So so writing, I think it was hard because it was so exhausting, you know, especially as time went on. It was hard because I think your creativity feels zapped when you're physically exhausted and you're scared and you're worried. We were away from home. Um, we left with winter clothes and ended up staying so long. We, we didn't, we didn't have any, we left wearing, like I had all my mom's clothes, like shorts on and stuff <laughs> by the time we left. So writing, it was tough. I mean, Sean and I talked about this a little bit. I feel like if I could concentrate though, even I changed how I started writing and I did it in smaller bits and I tried to give myself a lot of grace with that. And when I could um, get writing, even if it was just a really small word count and I was just trying to jump into it as much as I could, I always think creativity gives back to you in ways that 
are very surprising. And it wasn't just time in versus time out. I got more than I invested. So I felt like it was a way that I felt more like myself if I could keep writing. And I felt that I had gotten these little bits of refreshment, even in the midst of a lot of fear and uncertainty, trying to get food. I mean, I had friends in New York who literally could not get toilet paper and all this kind of stuff. And where, you know, we were afraid um, for very real reasons. Um, you know, people we know being affected severely. So for me, that was what worked really well. Lots of grace and a lot smaller amount of time. And I feel like it gave a lot back. Did, were you in the midst of uh, like a book or were you in edits? Like what stage were you at when your writing was interrupted? I was finishing up, um, I finished up a, actually a standalone book on Christmas. That's a um, fiction novel that we're working on selling right now uh, that I love. And it was one of the best things during that season because it was such a feel good book. And I always write a lot about, you know, beauty out of adversity. And even with this, it's a grittier side to Christmas. There's a lot of war stories in it that um, come out that are actual real stories. And then I riff on that with uh, fiction takes. So I loved it. It felt like it really helped me a lot. So it wasn't quite editing. It was definitely a lot of uh, creation, like from the beginning and then editing. And editing was actually, it was helpful because I didn't have a blank page for a lot of the time. I think that was a little bit harder for me. Uh, so yeah, so I really enjoyed that. And, um, and then I'm working on another current work in progress too, which was really only like a third of the way begun. So a little bit of both. The toilet paper thing was crazy of all the random things to happen this year. I know I talked about it with Jenny um, and we both Toronto and DC completely ran out of toilet paper. And then we, neither of us have used toilet paper since. <laughs> we just adapted. So Jenny, did you want to expand on that or do you want to go into how the pandemic I'm affected your writing? I was making progress on my book, which was unusual for me because I am a procrastinator and I write well under pressure, although I hate it. But I thought, you know, this time I'm going to really try to enjoy writing the next book. I have a long, you know, time away before my book is due. And I was, I was getting going, you know, and I wasn't stressed and I was having fun with the process and then lockdown, right? And that just kind of stopped everything because my, my process is delicate to begin with. Like one, one weird comment can kind of ruin the idea of the book. So I'm like, when I'm writing, I don't tell anybody what I'm working on because I can't, I can't handle anything coming at me. Um, but then with lockdown, you know, productivity stopped. And then I was, you know, trying also to promote the book that was coming out in April. And at the time in March, no one knew what the pandemic was going to do. What did this mean for book events? Were people going to be buying anything? Is my publishing date going to get moved? Some people's were. Everything was really kind of up in the air. And I had done exactly one Zoom event uh, prior to the pandemic, which was just a podcast. And I didn't know that we were going to go virtual. I didn't know that it was going to be this thing. So um, it was just a strange time and I, you know, can't say that I recommend releasing a book during the pandemic. Um, but I think the timing of my book, I got lucky because I think if it had been coming out in March when no one knew what was happening and everyone was really, really scared, I think that would have hurt sales a lot more. But I think because it came out towards the end of April, people were getting bored and kind of thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to upgrade my Netflix. I'm going to, you know, um, pay-per-view some movies and buy some books mm -hmm. um, and settle in and so I, that kind of helped but it was just a, it's it's been weird and I'm only now just beginning to kind of tiptoe back into the book but it's been so long since I've been away from it that I have no idea what I'm working on so, so Vanessa with you for the best came out in September right yes so were you um, in the midst of final edits for that or you, were you working on something new um I think I had some edits, but it wasn't, you know, too much. Um, I definitely wanted to get going on my third book. Um, and that was hard. What was helpful, I didn't know it at the time, but to kind of keep me in the zone, even if I wasn't writing, was I started a, a column for my local paper, the Providence Journal. And at that moment, like, so that would have been March. I hadn't really started my new book yet, or I had a little, but it just, it was really hard to write. 
right then. It was set in, it is set in 2008. So that was kind of cool to be far away. But I, I was also just like having a lot of trouble working on it. So I started writing these columns and, you know, I was, some weeks I was doing three columns a week just because, I mean, I was just in my house and it was sort of about the pandemic and parenting and just like weird stuff that suddenly came up about, I don't know, all of, I mean, I like look back at those columns and I honestly can barely remember writing them or what I was feeling and thinking. Like it's why really smart people keep diaries and journals because you do lose a lot of the emotion in the moment. Um, so that helped me to just keep those writer muscles strong, I would say. And um, I really just did it to kind of keep my sanity, but in the end it I think helped. So I was able to write a third book kind of from like maybe like April-ish, May-ish. And then I kind of had that first draft done by uh, September, right before my book came out. Um, so that's something. I mean, it's, it's not perfect or anything, but I definitely, I think when you're in such a stressful situation, there's like one side of you that can, you know, you can kind of, you can't write and you feel kind of blocked, but if you can get through it, it really does help. And I was just pouring so many emotions and feelings into this book set in 2008, but they were all drawing from where I was at, you know, right now. Yeah. Did, um, you know, with me, I mean, the pandemic's been great for me. You know, I, um, aside from the, the, the deaths and right. the economic uh, terror, the, um, I didn't really have a problem staying in and the writing came at a, like it came at a decent point where I was in the midst of editing. I was, I, I wondered how it would have been for somebody releasing a book right then. Yeah, or not, I'm sorry, not releasing a book, but writing a, starting a new book, you know, because I didn't know what people would write about. I mean, if you write, you know, like Lori does, if, it, if a, lot, a lot of it's historical fiction, you're somewhat given a reprieve from that. But I wasn't sure if people would want to write about it, want to read about it, if every book was going to be, you know, COVID related in the next couple of years or not. Um, so I felt kind of fortunate to avoid that and fortunate to release a book later rather than during that time. You know, I wonder, so many people when they were promoting their books were saying, I know it's, you know, a ter I know everything's terrible, but I do have a book to promote. Did you guys, are you normally shy about promoting your work or, and was that something you had problems with this year? I mean, I'm not, I'm not shy promoting my work. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy it, uh, but I'm learning that everyone kind of feels the same way. It's a necessary part of the job. Um, but I think at the beginning, you know, I felt just like, do people care? Is this going to be annoying, right? Like I have a book coming out and people can't get toilet paper. Um, I have a book coming out, people are sick. You know, is this even something people want to see? Um, and so I felt apologetic, like all of my posts relating to the book release were like, I know it's a tough time, um, but if you're looking for something to read, you know, here's my book. And it was just, it's like tiptoeing in and then kind of dropping it there and then tiptoeing out and then feeling really bad that you're kind of popping into people's days. But I feel like we've all given each other permission um, now to do that. I mean, we've always been supportive of each other's releases, but I think now we've all kind of had conversation where we're like, we have to do this and, and we get it. So it's been better, I think. I think people were, I think, we, we might have felt awkward <laughs> about it, but I think people in general were really appreciative of it because of the fear and the boredom. And I had all sorts of people where they wanted to read about it more. So they were looking at all sorts of books on pandemics. <laughs> like my friend, uh, Ella Marie Wiseman just wrote The Orphan Collector. It's about the 1918 uh, flu. <laughs> people were buying it like crazy and there were so many it's such a good book um but then others wanted to escape and then it gave a variety I think with all of us it was something I thought one of the hardest parts of the pandemic was all of us have been so grateful for what we do have and I you know even in the midst of really difficult a lot of difficult situations we were a lot of us were very grateful for our, the people in our life or our safety or whatever you know you, we had this uh it was easy to 
thank, you know, some of the things in our life, but there's nothing to celebrate. <laughs> and it was like, there's this lack of joy that was really hitting me hard too, with all the conferences being canceled and stuff. And so in a way, some of the launches I got excited about because out for other people, because I'm like, oh God, I can celebrate that. <laughs> so I think you're right. I think it might have been a little awkward for all of us that are promoting our own stuff. But honestly, I think it was received really well. What about you, V? You? Yeah, I, I, of course, always feel awkward, but I try to lean into stuff I do love. Like I love swag. So I got magnets and I got bookmarks and I, you know, built a little list of a few hundred people to send things to. And that made me happy. And Instagram always makes me happy. So I just tried to do the stuff I enjoy more. Um, and I would just also say it just on the sucky end of it. Like I really miss bookstore events. Like, and I know bookstores do too, because they're not making that much money off of, you know, Zoom stuff. They're doing all right on it, I think, but it's not the same not only from a standpoint of selling books, but just, you know, the actual community, the interaction, you know, I, my heart like breaks for people who debuted this year, because I just feel so lucky that I was the year before, because there were so many bookstores that I just reached out to, you know, because I had those relationships, but I would not have had those a year ago. And it's, and that's what a lot of this business is, you know, is relationships. So I could just contact them and say, Hey, I'll come sign books for you. Do you want me to? And they're like, Oh yeah, that, you know, your first one sold pretty well. So come back in. But if you're the first time emailing them, the first time calling them, not even popping into the store, which is what I did before right? For face-to-face, -face, like it's really difficult. So I love like a mighty blaze and places like that, that have really leaned into helping particularly debuts anyone. But I think for debuts, especially like it is the most bewildering process in the best of days. And so with COVID and just lower sales and bookstores being, you know, closed. And I mean, it was just a mess. So I, I really feel bad for debuts this year. You know, so much changed this year with conferences, you know, like you mentioned, uh, everything going virtual, marketing changed, uh, so many events were canceled. What was, um, for you guys, what was the biggest adjustment? And were there any changes that you actually preferred? Like for me, I actually really like the uh, virtual North bars we do. I love the in-person ones. I love the energy. And I really worried if that would translate. You know, I worried that, you know, I have a singer there. We have a mixologist. Um, and I was like, is this going to have the same kind of resonance that it would as a live event? Um, especially where you get, you know, people in a bar who are drinking and a little livelier. And actually the virtual events introduced something that I, I didn't think, you know, I, I, I wrote a piece for 1455's journal and I talked about, you know, that, that fear we all had at the beginning of the pandemic and the necessity and, and kind of how beautiful it was that everybody needed each other. You know, the first time I did a Zoom call with work colleagues, we were practically, you know, in tears. We were so happy to see each other and, and, and bewildered at the new way we were doing things. And we were all in it together. You know, we all had our kids around us. And obviously that, that, that split, right? We don't have that anymore. But I still find that there's uh, some of that's remained and, and the community that turns back to this is, um, is still, that, that keeps coming to these virtual, the virtual North bars that I do at other events, um, still seems to, 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 to have that connection. What about for you guys? You know, I, I, at first I really liked all the Zoom events because it was, there were so many things I couldn't go to before as a mom, like I can't travel to everything. And so I kind of would pick my events for the year. And usually that was BoucherCon and Thriller Fest. Um, but I couldn't do a lot of the little ones. It was just hard. And then this allowed, like doing everything virtually allowed everyone, I think, to jump in and do events, which they normally wouldn't do. I got to support bookstores across the US that I normally would never be able to visit. So that was cool. But I think what I've noticed, like now that we're nine months in and I've done a bunch of these now, I counted actually, I've done 50 virtual events. It's, you don't five get- Five zero, five. <laughs> five. Five zero, yeah, this is, this is, this one is five zero. Um, hey. I, I miss the, the, 
the energy that you get from talking to people in person, right? Because you're staring at your camera and you're seeing faces and it's wonderful to see everybody, but you're not getting the engagement from the audience the way that you would if you're at a, an event. And so it feels, it feels depleting in a way that going to BoucherCon or going to Thriller Fest or whatever wouldn't because there's that exchange of energy. And I think that's the part that I, I think I'm officially kind of burning out a little bit just because I miss everyone. I miss hugging and mm -hmm. sitting beside someone on a chair and then, and, and gossiping, right? Cause we can't, we can't gossip here because <laughs> people are, you know, it's different. I've that. been sending you private notes the whole time. Well, you do. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, during the, during the meeting, during right now, during the session. Yeah. More your V. I felt the same way. I, I hope that I was surprised how well the Zoom stuff works. And I loved that because I think in the desert <laughs> that we've been in to have that was like, oh my gosh, there's a breath of fresh air. Like when BoucherCon, I still remember when they had the first meeting that ended up being really long, but for all the nomination, the nominees, I jumped into the room when almost a lot of people had gathered already. And I started to get all teared up because so many of my friends' faces were on the same screen. And I was like, oh, <gasps> I didn't, I didn't know how much I missed that. So I love how much that has really helped a lot. And I think it's been uh, exciting to think outside the box like that. I hope, in the, but I, I'm like you, Jennifer, I, I miss the in-person stuff. I, I do miss hugging people all and, you know, just seeing how they're really doing in that one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection. But I hope in the future, maybe there's a hybrid, you know, maybe we yeah. do some more in-person and then like you were saying, doing things that, like I haven't been in to go to any of Ed's Noirs at the bars because of, you know, just distance. And so to be able to be part of it, this has been great. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. And I think it's helped us find some, like you're saying, some fun in what's not fun and connect with people. And like Jenny and I did an event at a Tulsa bookstore, you know, like it was just like, that's cool to be able to connect with places all over and at least meet them. And what I found is it's almost like, um, building a relationship with a store you probably you know wouldn't have booked an event at per se right but they're looking for content and connection and so you know there's a couple of bookstores that's able to have events at with another author's come her book's coming out tomorrow Shannon Doring and um just because of that you know kind of fun random thing you know when I go back to Chicago I've got two bookstores I want to go like meet people and say I had an event with you which would not have happened you know otherwise I could not have just made it to Chicago. Um, so I think it has also opened up opportunities for the future, knock on wood, um, God bless Pfizer, but I, you know, definitely <laughs> think it hasn't been, you know, ideal, but it's been enough and can also just lead to us having, you know, additional relationships with other places we wouldn't have had. So, you know, one of the things like, you know, the relationships and the, the benefits we got from this, you know, our not benefits, I'm sorry, the, the, um, whatever we managed really to salvage out of it, um, I think was even more rewarding, but, you know, like I mentioned, there is that for me, it was kind of a moment, you know, and I think it, for me, it was the George Floyd, uh, death where things, hi, Mark. Hi. <laughs> 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 been trying for a little while if I've been popping in and out. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the George Floyd death where, you know, there were protests in the street and people were masked and there was this, for me, kind of, um, obviously it was distressing, but it felt like at that moment, like that's where the divide happened, you know, rightfully, of course, but it's, it's where it, where it split and it changed a lot of my views about myself as a writer, um, and what I should write and what I should do. And I wondered if that, you know, because 2020 is so much, there's so much in this year. Did that have any effect on uh, you guys? It, it did for me because I feel like I, I, I feel a deeper responsibility to tell the story that I want to tell as best as I can tell it. Um, but I also know that I have to be uh, extra aware of the language that I use because 
I think we're all still growing and learning. Um, and the best example I can think of this is like my first novel, which was published back in 2011, is going to be re-released 10 years after it was published and it's getting a new cover. I've been able to write like a new acknowledgements page for it and it's coming out in mass market. Um, but I was, I got kind of paranoid. I'm like, I, I need to go back through this book and what did I write about 10 years ago and would I say the same things you know, now that I said then, and there were a few things that I flagged even in my own work where I'm like, you know what, I can say that better or you know what, I don't wanna use that word. Um, and so I do feel a deeper responsibility to, you know, if I'm going to write from the point of view of a character who is unlike me to make sure that I get it right, you know? And I think it's okay to write about people who aren't like us and we do that in fiction, um, but I'd really be careful about expressing it as authentically as we possibly can manage. Um, and I feel that stronger than ever. I mean, I've always felt that, but I feel that more now than ever. V, Lori? I can say, I mean, I, you know, for me, and I think this is something Jenny and I have talked about, like, I've never been afraid to express how I feel, but I'm generally somewhat passive. You know, I'm not, the, I'm not confrontational. I'm really not going to get in your, your face about something. So I'll stew about it and then I'll think about it. And then a few months later, I'll write a really mean spirited column about it that I'll then, <laughs> you know, sanitize down to where it's, you know, um, <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. passive. But, you know, that's, you know, I, I feel, I, I wonder, I, I, you know, it made me question my, myself and what I write, like, should I be taking a stronger stance in this? Should I be more direct? And, at that risk of, you know, am I staying true, I guess, sort of to what I want, the story I want to say. Yeah, I don't we, know, it's and you and Ed, like Ed, you and I had a lot of conversations about, you know, how much do we talk about these things on, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, you know, cause both of us are not confrontational people. And I, and I think we, we share a background that we just, we weren't raised to be shouty um, and not, there's nothing wrong with being shouty, but it's just, it, it's hard when you've been taught to be quiet your whole life about stuff. And the one thing you had said to me, and you probably don't remember this conversation because yeah. you never remember anything you tell me, um, but you said, I think you do that in your work. And I think that that's enough, you know, if that's where you want to express it. And it made me feel better, it did. Um, because, you know, I do try to be like, you know, brave in my work. And I think I'm braver in my work than I am in real life. Um, and I wish it, the two were more equal, but if I'm being super honest, I definitely would say I'm more courageous in my fiction than I am in my reality. Now, do you think you get a, a pass sort of for being non-confrontational non because you're Canadian? <laughs> <laughs> I can hide behind the I'm very nice and polite thing, but it only goes so far, right? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely as a, as a white woman really felt um, very confrontational. Uh, toward other white women in particular. <laughs> the results of the most recent election confirm that my confrontations have gone nowhere. Um, but I'm still trying because I think um, my second thriller, I began, you know, right after Trump was elected the first time. And I um, saw white women having a big role in his presidency and wanted to really explore white privilege, white female privilege. Um, and I would say, you know, I'm a more kind of an, a domestic suspense type writer. And that's a, you know, we're lucky that there are more women writers in that space, but it's a lot of white women. And so I did feel a big responsibility to really think about how privilege plays a role in how I write thrillers. And like my debut, my main character is like, busting into the police station and crawling in people's bushes and like all that good stuff which is fine I mean that is what you know what it is but when I sat down to write this I was like it just in the context of white privilege it just doesn't feel right and I have loved conversations that I've read about even police procedurals getting a second look and it's like you know can we really just have a hero cop when there's a lot of dimension to them and can often even be you know very serious issues of race or corruption or 
you know, you just write another cop and let's say he's black, like you can't just sort of make it that an element, you know, there's a lot more layers to that relationship and how he sees himself in those roles. And so I think for, you know, speaking for white writers, we know we need to be called out more when we get things wrong and we need to do our work to think about, you know, how it impacts what we're writing and, and also like very particularly, you know, in such a white industry to make sure we're lifting up diverse voices and supporting friends, you know, who aren't just a traditional white kind of type thriller, because that is a lot of what is published. And again, like, I'm happy there are more women and I'm happy, you know, publishing saw as a moneymaker. So they started publishing more women, but you know, we really still, even in that, you know, subgenre, have a long way to go for representation. I think that first of all, Jennifer, you're extremely brave <laughs> in person and in your work. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, art always has this capacity to move people. And I think that's why it's imperative that I think writers that we do talk, I mean, I, everybody's unique. So everybody has to do it in a way that they're comfortable with and they're um, wired. But I think some of the issues that we've come across in the past year and beyond are ones where there's lines drawn in the sand and it's not just on certain kinds of taxes or that to me that's politics. There's other issues that have come up that are racism, misogyny, all these things that I'm like, yeah, that's the hill I'll die on. Like that's to me, that's not... And also I write about the 30s for heaven's sake. So, I mean, I am always researching about these people in the 30s that were really good people that allowed really um, atrocious things to happen. And so I feel like, you know, our art does move people and it has a way of um, doing that. I think Jennifer in your uh, latest book, it was, you really delved into the mind of your main character. And to me, that spoke volumes. Um, and I thought that was really an interesting way to do it. In my latest book, The Pearl Dagger, um, I bring out, there's always art in all my books. And this last one was um, Orson Welles' Voodoo Macbeth. And it's the first all black theater cast in the, um, in, in, um, America and it was both British and American actors and everybody was really worried about it and it was a smashing success and it was because of the art you know and it had all this controversy centering it from the black crowd the white crowd the Shakespearean crowd everybody but everybody loved it and it's one of those seminal moments that I would do anything to go back in history to be part of it and that's because of the art and so I think that's where we all have a really big place yeah, that's, um, you know, I'm familiar with that. I, a former professor of mine was really into Orson Welles, and I'm familiar with that. So that's interesting. I, I had no idea you touched that. Also, saying that you wrote about the 30s and then following that with, for heaven's sake, is very on brand. So I just wanted to <laughs> concern it. <laughs> also, I either swear like a pirate or a 95 year old man. There's no one to <laughs> <laughs> One thing I wanted to, you know, talk about was, um, especially with the three of you, uh, is, you know, when I, when I first got into writing, one of the things that I, I thought was imperative was to um, do what I can to help uh, women who were writing, um, because there wasn't, it just, you know, I, I write thrillers, that's a very male-driven field, typically, um, and there were a lot of women I knew who, who were, but didn't feel uh, crime fiction, but didn't feel necessarily comfortable in that world. Um, you know, and I, I always say mistakenly, I should have done that for right, other writers of color. I just didn't know there were any others out there. Like I, I say, I was everyone's black friend and I'm not even black. I was just the closest, <laughs> you know, they have. So it, um, so I, I always felt like that was a missed opportunity. I was so grateful that people like Kelly uh, Garrett and uh, Gigi Pandian and Walter Mosley started Crime Writers of Color and, and really took the initiative to, to push that forward. But when it comes to, to women writers, what advice would you give to a debut uh, female crime fiction writer? Ugh. And I'm gonna interrupt with a well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> a debut, it's... 
you know, to be brave. I mean, to be fearless and to tell the story that you want to tell. Um, you know, for me, one of the, the things I got a lot of pushback on when I started writing was that the default, um, our default reader and a default novelist was white. And so my main character in my first book and all of my characters are women of color um, was to, I had to explain to the audience, to my readers that my characters weren't white and which was such a weird inauthentic thing for me to do because as a woman of color, um, my background is Filipino. I don't walk around thinking about my Filipino-ness ever. So the idea that I'm writing a character who is half Chinese, who is describing herself as Chinese to the reader was strange to me. It felt weird. Um, and actually those are the references that I took out in the edit of my first book that's gonna be re-released because they bugged me forever, but I didn't know how to push back at the time I was too young and I didn't have, like there was no social media for us back then where we could ask each other these questions in private. It was 2008, 2009. So it was, it was just different then, but I would say to a debut, you know, be push and be brave and, and it has to feel like you. Um, it's so not worth it if it doesn't feel like you. I get a lot of feedback too. I would ask for a lot of, um, if you have characters of color, getting just really good readers or um, my editor is a, a woman of color and she was so helpful because I was, I have a lot of characters who are people of color and, um, but I, I was having trouble. Like I, I don't, I didn't want to say their color if it wasn't necessary for the story either and she's like exactly she's like you like is it you know I mentioned um the main character's love interest is an Irish cop and he and this black cop are really good friends and there's some incidents that come up where you have to know their background so she's like so do it there it was excellent because I needed that advice. I needed to know, am I being too on the nose here? You know, what am I trying to do here? It's just, it's just who it is. Artists have, one of my main characters is an artist. Artists gather everybody. <laughs> I remember one of my, I based a character on an artist in New York City because I walked into his studio once He's a Japanese American and he had the most ridiculously awesome group of people around him huddled talking about art. They were so different from each other. And I was like, I love that. Like, that's the coolest thing. But I would get a lot of, I would get a lot of input on that particular topic, but also as a female writer is really connect this in this community of crime writers, the women are amazing. And I, I mean, I remember getting so much input and help and I've worked in a lot of other art and entertainment industries, and that is not the case. But here, people will like give me their card or, you know, and really mean it. You know, can I help you? How can I help you? And they meant it. And I think that was a very surprising perk of being part of the crime fiction community. So I think as a writer, a female writer, of reaching out, like putting yourself out there. And I think people really like to help each other in this industry, which is wonderful. I would add that if you're a woman writer, particularly going to be a debut, watch what white men are doing, watch what they're getting paid, watch what their publicity is and their marketing is, because you won't just get that. You all have to fight for it. And I think that because this is an industry full of people with dreams that often we um, take whatever we can get. And I also think that we allow ourselves to be used or tossed aside very easily. Um, and so if you can just get tough as early as possible, yeah. I think it will serve you because um, it's a business, capital B. And that's not a critique, actually. It's just true. And you need to know it's a business and know they're going to try to make money off of you and pay you the least amount of money. And the more advanced you have, the more they're going to put into you. And like, if you are a starry eyed artist, you will get hosed. Yeah. So you got to be real with yourself, have a really smart agent, um, advocate for yourself. Um, say no, even though it's hard. Um, because I just have a lot of friends and I know a lot of people, women, I know a lot of women who still, 
even several books in deals come out. These men get paid two, three times what they get paid. Um, their marketing is two, three times what their marketing is for no discernible reason other than just gender. Um, and that I'm sure that's doubly true, even just for, you know, people of color, actually probably triply, quadruply true for people of color. So I'm seeing that as a white woman, let alone a woman of color, um, which so um, definitely don't let your artistry and your dreams trip you up. Make yeah. sure you know it's a business. It took me a long time to feel worthy, you know, and I, if I could go back now, I wish I had felt worthy sooner. I think I would have saved myself a lot of heartache. Um, I didn't feel worthy enough to ask questions. I didn't feel worthy enough to ask for the things that, um, that I thought would make the book better. Um, and a lot of times that answer is no, and that's fine because um, we can survive the no. My only regret is I didn't ask. And so, you know, if you stick with it long enough and you improve your craft, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, the money sometimes comes. But in the meantime, you know, when you're in it, uh, don't forget what you're worth. That's the thing. And I, oh God, it took me four books to figure that out. So. And um, uh, Susie Coggins just brought up a great point. I'm on the board of Sisters in Crime and I'm actually a pretty new member. I've just been in that organization about three years. and hearing them speak and the reason they were kind of founded by Sarah Prinsky was about parody. And all of the reasons why she founded that organization remain. I mean, parody is a very, I mean, she kind of, I think part of it was around like, are men getting more reviews than women, which I'm sure is still true. But I feel like the money issue is even bigger now than it used to be. And I just, from a gut level, and I read publishers marketplace every single day, I think, you know, there's still some, I know there's a parody issue still, and that is like tenfold for writers of color. There are the little, you know, the one rock star moments for some, but if you are just like, you know, a normal writer trying to get a normal book published, there's a lot of issues there and the pay is low because it can be because we don't advocate because we're scared. And right. I group myself in that too. Let me ask a question, um, you know, because I know, you know, Susie and Tara here and John who are all published writers um, with agents, but for people who are watching this on Facebook Live or who see it after who are aspiring to be published, you know, um, are you guys comfortable pushing back against you know, everybody in the industry that you, and, and what would you recommend this? What advice would you give somebody to get, to get comfortable with that? You know, if you have to push back against your agent or your editor or your, and it's, and it's, you're new to the industry, you're not, you haven't gotten your footing yet. You know, how do you, how do you toughen up? It's hard because, you know, it took me so, it didn't, okay. It took me three months to get my agent, but it felt like three years. Um, and I knew how hard it was. And there were so many no's that when you get an agent, the last thing you want to do is mess that up. <laughs> you don't want to question how they do things. Um, and I'm really fortunate that I have a good agent. I've had the same agent for 10 years, but I've heard stories about people who were mismatched with their agent and they had very different ideas of how the career trajectory would go. And that's tough, you know, because when you finally have someone on the phone who's saying, I want to represent you, how do you then ask questions about, you know, what's your working style and are you gonna push for the most money? And, you know, do you edit? And what if I don't want you to? And, and so many of those things are like, they're decided between the author and the agent. That's just one example. And then same thing with the editor, right? You have to have an editor that you feel comfortable being yourself around. Um, and it took me a while to find that groove with, with an editor too. And I have it now, um, but it it's hard because when you're new, you feel like you have uh, no right to ask for those things or to push back. Who are you to say that this book is great and should sell for X number of dollars? Um, it's, it's such a delicate thing. You know, it's, it's, that's not advice. I, I rambling, but I, it's just hard. It's hard. And I feel for every new writer who doesn't know which direction to go. Well, I think I would, it, 
you have to ask questions a lot. And if you're, I'm on my second agent. And if your agent is either unable to ask questions or doesn't like you asking questions, that's a really good sign. Also, not every book is created equal. <laughs> my husband's been in the music industry <laughs> for 20 years and people would write songs. And then I think it's the best song that's ever been written. And you're like, it's not not the best song so it's books are like that too so just because you're I think you have to have a balance you have to be you have to accept critique and you have to constantly want to be better but you have to be able to push back like you said and I think getting a wide variety of people around you helps you with that you know um and yeah I would start asking questions and see how your agent or potential agent asks them answers them can they answer them or are they you know getting uppity about it or you know how do you work together even just in that way helps a lot if you go to the conferences more you start to know more ask questions there too about agents about publishers about everything because it's all information that helps you understand the industry a little bit better and to build on that I totally agree if if you look to community as we were talking about earlier um, one of the luckiest things that happened to me as a writer was that I was chosen for the 2014 pitch wars as a, they used to have alternatives. It was like the B team. So I was on the B team and Kelly Garrett, which that's rightfully so was the A team. And um, we had the same mentor. And um, I was, so I've been in this group of people since 2014 who were in pitch wars, A and B teams. And to learn from them of their struggles and they're on their, you know, second, third agents, book contracts pull, like to see the reality of what publishing is versus either what we've been told or what we've imagined, which is never accurate based on my experience anyway, what I imagined was not true. So as much as you can just connect to other people who are also on the same journey, even if you're all, you know, in the same place together, you know, to be able to grow together mm -hmm. to learn things together and share information and trust them because you have to be honest about this business information is power and if you're not talking about i mean i'm a big believer in like we should share how much we get advances and how much we've been making and like what our deals are and what our terms are because when that information isn't shared when you aren't open about it who does that give power to and it's not you so I think find people you can trust, find people in the community who are learning along with you or even ahead of you. That's, I think, the best to just learn from them too, to help bring you along so that you can professionalize even quicker because it takes all of us a long time to do it. And if you see other people ahead of you learning, having the setbacks when they happen to you, you'll just have more of a perspective, I think. I'm so happy that uh, for two things. First is that we had this panel because I love the three of you. And I knew when I met um, Vanessa, really when we, well, we met earlier, but when we started talking, I just knew her as like this nice person who posted a lot on Instagram. And then I had no idea she was like this warrior goddess who <laughs> just took heads right and left um so that was and i'm glad that, that came out tonight because <laughs> i wanted people to to see that but i also love the insight you guys uh provided and i know we're coming up to an hour so i thought maybe we should i don't know sean if we're close to wrapping up but i wanted to um there was one question i wanted to ask because one of the things that i love that the three of you touched on is the community and how important it is. And it's something that I know the, the four of us really cherish um, and Mark too. Um, <laughs> so I want to say, you know, we talked about 2020 and the change abroad and, and the, the change that for, you know, for Jenny and myself and, and for you guys too, like what it meant for our writing. Um, so this year happens and somebody somebody gets motivated, right? They want to, the kind of person who doesn't usually march, wants to march, wants to be an ally. What to each of you makes a good ally? You know, for me, it was, you can't save everybody and you can't save the whole world as much as you want to and as much as you feel you should. Um, so you pick, you pick your little corner 
um, and you do the best you can with what you have. And so for me, that was really um, joining the board of ITW um, because I felt like I could be <laughs> in a place to make sure that all kinds of books are championed. You know, I, you know, my role, I don't have anything to do with judging, but I recruit judges and I could, you know, get in there and make sure that the panels were as diverse as possible, that they were people of color, writers of color, various levels of experience, different publishing backgrounds to make sure that they're reading from a wide variety of viewpoints so that all books are considered. And that was, that's the way I can help. I, I can't fix everything, um, but I can help the process of championing all kinds of books. And that was important to me. I would, I would just add the kind of my advice is more just for white people, particularly white people trying to be allies. This is simple, but it's needed. Look at who you're reading on social media. And not that we're all reading like crazy right wing stuff. I don't mean that. But I mean, like, what voices are you listening to? And is it white people talking about people of color issues? Or is it people of color talking about that issues? You need to assess your Twitter feed. You need to assess your Facebook and your Instagram. All of it. And I think you may be surprised at how few diverse voices you have. And so part of our work is to really seek out those voices, um, support them by their books, whatever, but just on a day in day out basis, you need to make sure you are not just listening to other white liberals because um, those voices are fine and helpful, but they're not gonna make you grow that much. So push yourself to continually assess what you're hearing, what you're reading. Like, look at what you read last month. Is everybody white? Probably. So like, let's do better the next month. Like, I think it's really, you, it, because of the structure that we have, this white system, it is very easy to be a good person who's not racist, who is only listening to white people. So we have to really make sure that's not where we are. I think for me this year, I've learned a lot too, where you, your, your voice matters. And what if there's a part, an issue that's important to you, it's important to me to stand up for other women too. And one of the things I learned the most is that the people who really change things, the it's, it's not the powerful and the wealthy people. It's the people who have just, there's a line drawn and they're like, and enough. And you look at your allies of like, are they the kind of person that will stand up for what they believe in? Will they stand up for me? Am I the kind of person that will do that? And I feel like so many times you wait for um, the people of uh, maybe that are wealthier or have been around the industry longer or, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. But really it's the changers are the ones that just take a stand. And so I think your voice is really important and, and um just yeah, look around and see if those are the kind of people that are that are around you and be that kind of person for other people. I'd say that, you know, to touch on what three of you said too, you know, it resonated with me. I mean, the my favorite writers, uh, when I started really taking writing seriously, were James Baldwin and F. Scott Fitzgerald. They have very little in common. And they have very little in common with me. You know, one was, uh, you know, alcoholic, uh, very slight man, and they're also a very slight man, but, you know, a gay black man. And their writing wasn't similar, but something about their writing really captured me, but for different reasons. And the same is true with you know, Flannery O'Connor and others, but I, I, I think, you know, the reason that we're all, you know, that, that, you know, we're, we're writers, we're writing, so we've had those experiences where you've connected with people that you have nothing in common with, and maybe we're a little aghast when we come across bigotry, because that is, you know, so antiseptic to what we, what we really love and believe. Um, but I would say that what I, one thing that I wanted to, to add on that is for me to I think a good key that I've seen in, in people who are good allies, good supporters, is the listening. 
um, be like Vanessa and Lori said so well, uh, being a better listener has been um, the real key to being a good ally. Um, so I want to say thanks again to everybody for thanks, man. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, this will be recorded, right, Sean? As well, or yes. Recorded. Yep. So, so yeah, we will be able to repurpose and, and share um, the knowledge that was dropped here. Thank you, guys. This was so fun. Yes, this is really great. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to thank you all, and uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this out there. I, I think there's there's a lot of there's so much great stuff because and, and I think the first part of this discussion necessarily kind of looked back at the year we've had. I want to both invite and threaten this entire panel to be the first booked panel for our 2021 Lit Fest, and we can have a follow-up discussion and see where we are circa summer of 2021, because I think that warrants further discussion and an update, and, um, you know, we, we can pick up where we left off and, and see where we are eight months or so from now. Cool. Oh, that sounds great. Great. I have no plans. Well, I'll, I'll let Ed have the last word. What I will simply say is thank you all. Lori Chandler, Jennifer Hillier, Vanessa Lilly, and Ed Amar, whose book comes out tomorrow. Yes. Congratulations. Woo! Ed, Ed, what's it about? What's it about, Ed? It's just a story. Buy it, buy it. <laughs> Pitch your book. Pitch your book. No, I want to thanks. Uh, thank you, Sean. And thanks so much to uh, everybody for tonight. tonight. Thank you, Jenny and Lori and Vanessa. Um, I love this conversation. I'm so glad we're able to have it. And I know we'll be in touch soon. Yay. Thank you. For buy sure. Ed's book. Awesome. And then awesome. everyone. Couldn't have enjoyed it more. Keep writing and uh, keep fighting. <laughs> Will do. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Good night. <laughs>